Hi, this is Paul James Caden with Journey into Spiritualism. On today's show, I would like to share with you a classic episode from my former podcast, The Spirit Side. I had some really great guests on that show, and we really did discuss some important topics that relate to spiritualism. Before I discontinued The Spirit Side, I saved some of those episodes with the intent of sharing them here one day. So for the next several Fridays or so, I'm going to be sharing some classic episodes from the spirit side. And today, what you'll be hearing is an interview that I did with the late, great Rosemary Ellen Guiley almost two years ago on the subject of angels. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spirit Side Podcast. Joining me today is Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Rosemary, thank you for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us about angels today. Well, it's a pleasure, Paul. Uh, this is a good time of year to talk about angels. People are focused on angels more during the, the end of the year and the holiday season than they are at other times. And yet angels are around us all the time, and I think it's important to uh, bring their presence and their role home. It certainly is. Uh, as I was podcasting uh, just l- earlier this week and last week, <clears throat> I was uh, I had a personal angelic experience this time of year, and it's Usually when we hit November, I really start thinking about the angels and feeling their energy uh, very much near. But I was wondering in the beginning here, could you tell us a little bit about what angels are? Because some people are still confused about who they are, what their function is. Some people think it's their grandmother, their parents, their their favorite pet. But who and what are the angels? Uh, we do have many ideas about angels, and there's n- no one fast definition of an angel, but an angel encompasses many things. And uh, primarily, the angel is an intermediary, the, an interface between us and the Godhead, however we define the Godhead. This is a role that intermediary beings like angels have in all spiritual paths and traditions. They might go by other names besides angels, but they have the same function, to be an interface, because the Godhead, the supreme, the all that is everything, is kind of an abstract concept, and the human heart yearns for something personal. We like personal connections, and so the angel becomes a very personal way to help us Uh, develop spiritually and have a relationship with the Godhead. Uh, Angels are not the same as us. They are distinctly different. Uh, They tread uh, their own path, but we have many intersections with them. And as intermediaries and interfaces, uh, they um, traditionally, in lore, Uh, take our prayers to God. This is how we help to develop a relationship with the Godhead is through prayer. They take our prayers to the Godhead and bring the answers back. They have protective qualities. Um, They are guardians in many respects. They're guardians of individuals, of countries, races, uh, groups of people, planets, um, the world of nature. They have many fun overseeing kinds of functions. Right. And as guardians, they do offer a lot of protection. Um, we have many stories of angels delivering mor- miraculous rescues. But by and large, they're not tasked with pulling our chestnuts out of the fire. There are reasons why some people get mirac- mor- miraculous rescues. Um, so they're not here to do our job for us. They're here to help us. Uh, grow in life, develop spiritually, and make the best possible decisions we can on our path. They will provide comfort and advice. But here again, they're not going to direct everything for us. So we can have a very good relationship with the angelic realm. Uh, And I think it is important to cultivate one. Uh, They are energy beings. They have no distinct form, but they will often appear in human form, and I think that's for the purpose of helping us relate to them. Uh, We see them as idealized images of ourselves, that if we were 
to uh, to be the idealized human, we would be angel-like. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to a question that I get asked a lot, which is, can people become angels after they pass on? Um, my feeling is that they can become angel-like. Uh, we have so many stories of people say, well, my grandma died, and um, she's my guardian angel now. She's always around, and she gives me advice and really helps me out. Well, that's an angel-like role. It doesn't mean grandma's become an angel, but she's become angel-like. And I think that happens with a lot of people. It's a choice that... Um, souls make when they pass on or, uh, how close they're going to remain to people on, um, who are still living and in what capacity are they uh, going to continue to be present. There are, however, beliefs that people do become angels. And Emanuel Swedenborg, who was a mystic several centuries ago and had conversations with angels, uh, believed very strongly that after death, people are going to either become angels or demons. He saw heaven and hell as being kind of fixed states. Right. Uh, and um, people in the afterlife comment that angels remain available to us after we pass on. They continue to help with the growth of the soul. Um, we also have concepts that there are angel-human hybrids on the planet, that we've had intermingling's throughout history. So... Uh, all of these scenarios uh, could be possible, but my personal belief is that angels are distinctly different from us. And I was given a message uh, to that effect some years ago uh, where the angels told me, do not confuse us with you. Uh, we're different, we, but we, we walk parallel paths, and there are many intersections, and we are the embodiment of unconditional love. And I think that's uh, an important way to look at angels that uh, this is what they bring to us. Uh, the energy of divine light and unconditional love is, uh, these are the highest frequencies of energy that we can access. Uh, this is what the human soul strives for, is evolving toward, and angels are um, this helpful uh, presence, force, in the cosmos that provides us a lot of aid. Yeah, I, be I believe they definitely do, and uh, it it's true what you said. A lot of people, uh, you know, when you talk about God or the angels, uh, they they kind of want these beings to bring the answer right to their front door. But uh, in many people's experiences that I've read, and and even my own, that's that's never the case. They put the tool in your hands, but then they always say you have to do the work yourself. And oftentimes, as human beings, we. Uh, we trip over those tools and don't always get from point A to point B as smoothly as we should. Uh, but it's certainly up to us. There's always a lesson to learn. There's uh, spiritual growth uh, to be gone through. And I think it's important for people to, to realize that as well. They're not our, uh, our heavenly maids and butlers who are going to bring, you know, uh, our requests right to the, uh, the doorstep and drop them off for us. Well, exactly. And uh, yet, you know, I, I, well, I've interviewed so many people about their angel experiences over the years. And some people say, well, I ask my angels questions about what I should do in a certain situation. They'll give me an answer. Um, but my belief is that angels work in ways that are best for each individual. How is the best way to get something across? And um, we have our higher self. The higher self is that part of our consciousness, which is our steering mechanism on our path in life. And um, angels may work with the higher self uh, to present information to people. And so... I think sometimes we can't really parse where something is coming from. Uh, you, you pray to the angelic realm and, and you get an answer and guidance. And is it the angel, the angelic realm is working with your higher self to present that information to you and you think it comes from angels or it comes from your higher self? In the end, does it matter? You get the information you need. But you do it by... Um, by reaching out to this to this interface, I've had angel experiences my my whole life, and I'm very close to the angelic realm. And uh, yet, uh, I've never relied on them to uh, to solve everything in my life. Um, everybody has crises, ups and downs, obstacles, problems, uh, challenges. Um, 
that angels will help you find clarity, the path of light, and see your way through things. They are also a tremendous channel of comfort, and I think all of us have situations in life where uh, something happens and we really need to find our inner strength so that we can make it through something. And uh, the angelic realm is very good in that regard. Yeah, they, they, they definitely are, and I think that's why uh, even some people, if you read about the, the deathbed visions or experiences, there's that point where people just become so peaceful they're they're not afraid you know they're they're seeing people who aren't there but they're describing them as being so you know beautiful or heavenly or made of light and all the fear is gone they're they're not in pain anymore they're not worried about what's happening to the physical body i think just the the presence of an angel just really brings divine love and light you know, right where we are. And, and like you said, that in and of itself can be a, a tremendous source of strength and comfort, no matter what's going on around you. I often say that, you know, the world could be uh, literally going to hell in a handbasket, but if there's an angel standing next to you, it doesn't really matter so much because you just have that peace that, as the Bible says, surpasses understanding. No matter what's happening in the physical, you're just not move to that fear or that sorrow like you would if you were just facing it, you know, on your own or uh, maybe without the belief, you know, in, in angels or something higher. Uh, very well said, Paul. And yes, in the case of deathbed visions, um, people are very comforted by visions of angels. In fact, historically, that's one of uh, the uh, angels' significant roles is to help us Across that bridge uh, to the afterlife, um, they are um, escorts, mm -hmm. and the people also see their departed loved ones in uh, in their final moments as well. Uh, these have been very well documented uh, in recent times, culture to culture. They're very consistent in terms of the uh, characteristics of these visions. And uh, so I, I do believe that we have a spiritual presence that is, is with us all the time. We do, and that, that kind of launches us into uh, part two I wanted to talk about on the podcast. You know, I was talking a couple weeks ago, I did a podcast on, you know, holiday depression and people get the blahs and the blues. And I was saying, you know, even if you're alone, there were holidays that, I've spent alone, you know, really not uh, a lot of people around, if anyone. Uh, times where, you know, your your best of friends seem to scatter to the, the four winds, and, you know, you find yourself with, uh, you know, no one really around. But I always took comfort in, you know, that angelic presence, and it's just so uplifting and joyful. And I was telling people it's, it's a good time of year. I mean, any time's a good time of year to really – commune with the angels and tune into their energy how would you tell people to to do that i mean there's a lot of ways a lot of books that people say well do it this way do it that way some are really overly complicated it's mental and spiritual gymnastics i don't even think the average person would have the patience you know to, to sit down and do uh, you know i i know i wouldn't and i'm i'm quite a spiritual person but how would you tell the average uh Joe and Josephine out there, uh, a way to, to connect with their angels, to feel that personal presence of comfort and love in their lives. It's very simple, and it doesn't need to be complicated at all. Uh, and that's simply through prayer, prayer and meditation. And prayer is one of the most powerful spiritual forces that we have at our disposal. And uh, by sitting down in prayer and asking to be connected to the angelic realm, uh, and the personal angels around us. I believe we all have a guardian angel that follows us throughout our entire life. Maybe we have even more than one. We certainly have more than one angel around us at any given time because I, I think uh, the angelic realm responds to whatever is going on in a person's life. And some angels come and go as we work through different situations and challenges. So simply asking in prayer and waiting uh, for a response is uh, the best way to connect. Uh, 
Um, and uh, if you want to connect with your guardian angel, ask to uh, for that angel to be present and to get a name, uh, because the name is a vibration of energy which will in turn help you to connect more easily. It does not have to be a fancy biblical name. I've talked to people whose guardian angels are Sam and Bob and, uh, you know, Anne. Uh, I think angels present, again, however is the most meaningful for each individual. And that's very effective. Um, Now, how angels answer... Uh, again, depends on the individual, and it, and it depends on how we are receptive to re- to getting our information from the spirit realm. Sometimes people think that the answers are going to have to be very dramatic, sort of a you know something you can't ignore, the booming voice of of God in the head, for example, or um, an apparition in front of them. And the ways of the spirit world are very subtle. This is why it's important to cultivate prayer because. Prayer is a refining energy of consciousness, and it is important to meditate every day, which also refines consciousness and helps us um, tune into the subtleties of the spirit realm. Um, Angels will often impress thoughts in the head, and it is kind of an inner voice. Um, People tend to doubt that because the first thing that arises is, oh, well, am I imagining that? Um, Is that what I think it ought to be? You know, we have kind of that counter inner voice that immediately wants to judge and assess and um, dismiss even. But we have to allow things to arise within us. And when I'm coaching people in meditation and connecting to the spirit realm, I tell them to just pay attention to whatever arises spontaneously within you because that is the voice of spirit speaking. You can analyze and judge later. Uh, but accept in the moment so that you can allow the process to continue. So angels will impress thoughts. They can influence our dreams. They deliver uh, answers through signs and synchronicities. Sometimes it's quite obvious, like the feather that falls on the floor Mm -hmm. or the proverbial penny from heaven. It might be something very personal for an individual that's meaningful to that person only. They also speak through the words and actions of other people. We all become agents of angels in many respects by saying and doing things that has a synchronistic importance for someone else. And we may be angels unawares in in that regard. Uh, So uh, sometimes it's quite dramatic. Uh, Not everybody will see an angel. Um, I... um, I usually feel, sense, and hear angels uh, rather than seeing them. I have had some very striking visual apparitions. When I see them, it's usually as pillars of light that are so intense I can't look directly at the light. Uh, But, uh, again, I stress it's different for every individual. So the universe is magical, and it, it responds to and molds itself to Every individual, there is that power in the cosmos. And if we think of the universe as magical and responsive to us individually, that in turn helps, opens the gateways to developing that relationship. It is, and it's, it's funny when you, you talk about inspiring our thoughts and, and people thinking, well, is that just me? Am I making that up? Uh, I read uh, an Islamic hadith a ways back. Uh, where Muhammad said, how else would God speak to me if not through my imagination? And I think that says a lot because, you know, I've I've had in my, you know, angelic experience, it, it was dramatic at times, and then other times, particularly uh, in recent years, uh, it's, it's more subtle. It is in meditation. It is focusing. And sometimes you hear words, phrases, or sentences Uh, Sometimes it's like a little scene that will play out before my eyes, but or or the the screen of my imagination rather. And the thing of it is, I always tell people, you know, when when you're getting information from the angels, because those words, those sentences, those phrases, they come almost as like a download. It's not like you're making it up word for word, and the little scenes that play across, almost like a daydream before the mind's eye in meditation you just kind of get caught up in it. You know, you're not making it up. You're not making this happen. Uh, And I say that's usually a pretty good earmark that 
uh, you know, your thoughts, your imagination uh, is being influenced by the angels. And very true. And and um, yes, we that that is a very good hadith uh, about imagination. Um, we misuse the term imagination, and debunkers and skeptics will dismiss things by saying, "Oh, it's just your imagination," mm-hmm. as though it's a hallucination or a fantasy. Imagination is the faculty that enables us to live, to create to vision, and to have a relationship with the spirit world. Without imagination, we would have nothing uh, in physical life uh, because we would uh, would have no power to vision anything and bring it into manifestation. So uh, I do so many uh, different kinds of workshops with people for connecting with spirit, and that's one thing that I emphasize, that... Yes, it is your imagination. Your imagination is the conduit, just like electricity is a conduit of power. And this is how the world of spirit um, can access you. Uh, And so pay attention. And when people are able to get past that obstacle, it really opens up their own intuitive and, and even psychic abilities. And that's another way that the angelic realm addresses us is through our intuition, a knowing Mm -hmm. uh, that we may ask for help, for guidance, for an answer, and then we just suddenly know the answer, and we know that it's the right answer. So we we are assisted in so many ways, uh, and yet they're, they're both subtle and yet dramatic at the same time. Yeah, I like how the uh, the Christian scientists they they refer to angels as angel thoughts, and they say they're they're the direct thoughts of the divine coming to you in a moment of need, when you get that holy cow moment, or that thought that says, you know, why didn't I think of that before? That's an angel coming to you, or an angel thought. So you know, in their their practice of metaphysics, you know, they they really. Uh, they really believe in that and 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 they teach that you know pay attention to your thoughts because you never know you know when an angel is going to speak to you you know in your your thoughts your imagination your mind your intuition and i i do think that's very important and i do think it gets lost in translation because in today's modern world uh, when you do say imagination it's always well that's something for kids. Well, kids do that. It's it's for play and making things up, and it really has uh, lost a lot of importance and power in the way we we define imagination uh, in this day and age. Absolutely, and so I'm always seeking to reawaken people to what imagination really is and the power that's in it, and. Um, in in many respects, angels may be very abstract to us. It may be, you know, closer to that Christian science concept of the thought energy. Mm-hmm. It's pure energy. Um, I think the personification of angels in human-like form and with personalities, um, which is a way that force of the Godhead and the cosmos molds itself to to human beings is very purposeful and has helped um, so many people have something they can relate to uh, because again it's it's we emotionally when we are trying to connect to something we we want to relate in a personal way it's very hard for human beings to relate to something abstract mm-hmm. and so when monotheism supplanted the uh, the pantheon of the personalized aspects of the godhead through the gods and goddesses um, that's really when uh, a lot of the angelic power came to the fore because it was a more perceived as a more personal uh, energy and interface that could help human beings deal with something that was very abstract, that had no image, no uh, n- nothing that we could conceive in our minds uh, other than a force. And so um, I think that uh, people need to believe in angels how it best suits them. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, I was saying early that uh, early on in, in the show that 
there are many concepts of angels, and they're all right in a way. You know, none of them are wrong. Uh, they're all right, but it, but the fundamental uh, definition, I believe, is is this intermediary that uh, helps us connect to higher things and our higher self as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm a very big believer that you know there's no human being or religion that can tell us exactly what God is or exactly what uh, lies on the other side. Uh, but I believe that force is loving it is you know personal to us but i also think that it relates to us in the way that we understand it you know um there's a lot of different people in the world we can't go to every single person and say well uh you must be a christian you must be a buddhist you must be a muslim or 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 whatever you know defining you know god and the the spirit world for them because everybody has their own way and and i think that the angels god call it what you will meets them right where they're at and speaks to them or even uh, appears to them in a way that they understand and that's comforting to them well, exactly. And for some people, having an experience where a human-looking angel manifests and interacts with them in some way um, may be the perfect, appropriate way for that uh, encounter to happen, as opposed to something that, for another person, the more powerful connection might be in a more mystical experience that's an, ex uh, an expansion of consciousness. Uh, without the appearance of a particular being. Uh, and it's very fluid. The spirit world is very fluid and very malleable. Uh, the people who have dramatic rescues, for example, the, uh, the serious stranger phenomenon, uh, very well documented. And the characteristic of that is person in crisis, person in sudden crisis, sudden appearance of a mysterious stranger who is very odd in many ways and has some unusual physical characteristics, but in the moment of crisis, the experiencer is not questioning things and does something to solve the crisis, avert the crisis, uh, rescue the person, and then make a sudden disappearance never to be found again. Mm -hmm. uh, there's often very little communication. Uh, sometimes there is, uh, but very little to no communication, and if the experiencer tries to find that individual uh, to thank them, there's no such person. Um, and people ask, well, why doesn't that happen all the time? Why, why is this person who's about to drive over the cliff to their death get saved and somebody else not? Um, very difficult questions with, of course, um, no comforting answers for everyone. Um, it may have to do with a person's time to go. It may have to do with karmic factors that we don't know or understand. It may have to do with this is the kind of experience the person needs to get them jump-started on their spiritual path. And uh, that's usually the case when people have some kind of dramatic encounter is it, it turns their life around. Uh, whereas some of the rest of us may not need that. We may only need the, the ongoing, uh, gentler, uh, more subtler ways of interactions with the angelic realm in order to uh, steer our path. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. You know, there was a time I wasn't so sure about reincarnation, but now the more I read, the more I meditate and think and look into different philosophies, the more I think that, you know, some of these things do happen. Because uh, like you said, it could be karmic, it could be their time to go, there could be some uh, greater lesson. Uh, and sometimes I always tell people, you know, stuff just happens. We live in a fallible world. Uh, run by man, you know, and a lot of things can go wrong, you know, <laughs> with health and machinery and buildings. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a perfect world. Sometimes things can just happen, uh, you know, no rhyme or reason. They, they just do. And in, in some cases, it may be that the very best that we can expect from the angelic realm is um, a, sh 
shoulder to lean on as we make it through some very difficult, debilitating situation. Definitely. I, I definitely feel like they're, they're counselors and they are helpers that way that, you know, they, they do guide us through the wilderness in those challenging times. And if, if we pay attention and, and walk with them, uh, we do come out of the other side of those things with much more knowledge, wisdom, strength. And um, I always say, don't stay in the land of sorrow longer than you have to. You know, listen to your intuition, pray, meditate. Uh, even if it's a little spark of light at first, let it lead you forward because it will take you to a better place than where it found you. And that kind of brings us to part three of the podcast. Uh, I wanted to talk about angelic protection. And we talked a little bit about that, people getting the, um, you know, the dramatic rescues and, and so forth. But I wanted to delve into the area of, you know, you've done a lot of work and, and written a book about the jinn, um, alien abductions. You know, I, I, I think you believe they're more interdimensional beings uh, rather than men from Mars. How do... How do the angels factor into this? Because there's a lot of people now, because there's there's so many things in the news. There's always strange lights in the sky. There's strange things happening all over the world. There's so many people uh, complaining and, you know, they're, they're being visited by the shadow people or uh, the smiling man or some other entity in their bedroom at night. Is it possible, and have you heard of anyone invoking angels for protection against such things and does it work uh, yes it is possible to invoke angelic protection against uh, dark forces and entities and how well it works depends a lot on the situation and what's going on internally uh, within a person and why these things are happening in the first place and this gets back to what i was saying earlier that angels are not going to automatically pull our chestnuts out of the fire. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to uh, resolve all of our issues for us. Uh, I have always invoked angelic protection uh, in my work, uh, as well as just in daily life, and I frequently wear an amulet that is the, the seal of the Archangel Uriel. Um, and um, I did a book called Guide to Psychic Protection that came out this year, and I talk about the angel medals in the book. Uh, amulets are, are protective uh, things or objects. Um, they're not going to magically do something for you, but they are ways for you to connect with powerful forces. That's how I view them. And the more you handle and wear an amulet, the more it takes on this kind of energy. And uh, the reason why I wear Uriel instead of Michael, Gabriel, or Raphael, uh, the, the four big ones, um, I, I do have a good relationship with all of them, but Uriel holds the solar flame of truth. And I'm a writer. I'm about pursuing truth. And so I feel a very strong personal connection. When I was looking at these years and years ago, when I was looking at these medals and handling them like, hmm, which one is the right one for me to wear? When I picked up Uriel, I felt like an electrical vibration in it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is the right one for me, even though I use all of them. Um, do you need one of them to invoke the protection of angels? No, you certainly don't. You can invoke the protection of angels through prayer. Um, and I do that as well. Um, there are uh, many cases, however, where uh, people reach out in prayer for help, and it doesn't seem to do anything with what's going on in their situation, or it works for a while and then it doesn't work. And these are very complex situations that have no easy answers, no one-stop fix, um, a lot of these dark entities are very powerful. They have different motives for interacting with people, different abilities. They're affected in different ways. Some of them are easily affected by the, um, the protection measures that we uh, use, and some of them are not. Uh, and for those that are not affected by, for example, the Lord's Prayer, the name of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, um, the saint this or saint that or the angel realm, um, 
why not? What's going on that uh, these entities are able to get around those things? And uh, in some of these cases, it requires a very deep look into what's going on in an individual's life, uh, what they... Uh, why they have vulnerable boundaries and why something is pestering them in the first place. What's the point of origin? It doesn't happen for no reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, and is it something that started in this life or in a previous life? So some of these situations get very complex and may take a long time to unravel, not just with spiritual measures, but with traditional measures, even like psychotherapy and medical help. Yeah, I've I've always found um, I've done a little bit of uh, paranormal, you know, investigating in my in my realm. Not, not as much as you, of course, uh, but I've I've also had when I was growing up. I always say the the neighborhood I grew up in when I was about thirteen to fifteen. It was like the Amityville horror. I mean, everybody, all the kids in the neighborhood, I mean, we were seeing things. We we never, you know, went outside alone after dark. Everybody was always looking over their shoulder. And in that neighborhood, there was a lot of negativity. I mean, the the grown-ups, you know, spousal abuse, drinking, alcoholism. I mean, you name it. It was a small neighborhood with a lot of troubled people. And... I found that the older I got and and the more that I just kind of left that energy, you know, those thoughts, I didn't let it, I didn't let it weigh me down like, oh, you know, these miserable people, you know, some parts of my childhood was, were, were so terrible. I, I just found that I, I walked out of it and little by little those things, and some of it followed me because I, I left that neighborhood. I, I went to live with my grandmother at one point. And uh, some of the same things started happening around me even when I got out of the neighborhood. But that's when I started kind of growing spiritually and and leaving a lot of that kind of thing behind. And it just faded off. But a lot of people that I grew up with that did let that stuff kind of stick to them, it still affected them. You you could talk to them today and they, they would tell you stories of, odd things that happened to them, strange things that they've seen that were creepy or scary in the shadows and even, you know, reams of bad luck, just terrible things happening to these people. Like, you know, the, there's something just out to get them, you know, just sabotaging their lives. So I, I think, you know, if you're negative, if you're violent, if you're angry, even if you're carrying around a lot of resentment in becoming the kind of person that life is so hard, it's so terrible, nothing ever works out. It's all my parents' fault when I was little. They they did this. My my uh my siblings, you know, my siblings they are no good. They did something to me. When you have that kind of heavy energy and heavy attitude, I, I feel that you open the door wide to those things and if they're a problem, they're gonna continue to be a problem because they feed on it. They want you to be in that state. They want to keep you in that state. And I think walking out into the light, you know, in love, forgiveness, personal inner peace is tremendously important in getting rid of those things and uh, kind of vanquishing them from our lives. And dark entities feed on low emotions, uh, depression, guilt, anger, resentment, despair, grief. We all go through those, uh, and sometimes we get mired in them or we harbor them. And if we are in an area where a lot of those forces are present, uh, and they vary in concentrations on the land, there are entities that live on and off the land, uh, they live off the energy of the, of the land, and uh, we find pockets where people run into all kinds of problems all the time because of where they, they move into a certain area, and it's known for accidents and bad luck and illness, divorces, drug abuse, uh, and then other areas where people are very balanced and, and happy. Um, these variances in the landscape were recognized by the ancients. Plato wrote about it in Republic and he said that there are places on the planet that belong to the gods and spirits, and we should 
know this and pay heed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so people can be affected uh, for a variety of reasons, and sometimes things can attach to us, and uh, we carry them around for a very long time, whether we realize it or not, and may not erupt in violent assaults and poltergeist activity like TV likes to portray, Mm -hmm. but they can be an eroding influence on life. Now, we're talking about the vibration of energy here and the spiritualization of consciousness, and this gets straight back to the core matter of spiritualizing your consciousness as much as possible, literally raising your vibration. Because if you raise the vibration of your energy field and your uh, mindset, your consciousness, everything's going to lift to a level where negativity has nothing to latch on to. Uh, and this is one of the greatest protections that we can afford ourselves, and we can work on that with the help of the angelic realm, which is at a very high vibration. So that is why it is so important to have a daily practice of both prayer and meditation. And I have emphasized meditation for years. I've been a meditator most of my life um, because meditation is a bit different than prayer. In prayer, we're asking for something, uh, where meditation is more of a stilling of the mind uh, in terms of making a connection. And... um, It also is like going literally to the energetic or psychic gym. You know, you're going to build up your spiritual muscle just by meditating for a few minutes a day. Uh, I can't tell you, Paul, the number of times people have answered me by saying, oh, I'm too busy, I can't concentrate, I can't still my mind, I can't, I can't, I can't. Uh, It's very easy to meditate, and you don't need to be a yogi to do it. Nobody's asking you to, you know, go off to a mountaintop and be in total silence. You can meditate in the midst of hubbub in, in the uh, daily world if, if you know how to still yourself. And uh, I've studied many kinds of meditation over the years. I, I was very involved in Zen meditation and uh, yo- different kinds of yogic meditation. And I eventually evolved, evolved my own personal style of meditation. And when I travel, I keep a busy travel schedule, um, so sometimes I don't meditate every day. But I have made it a point to meditate uh, as much as I can. And um, I think that that's one of the things that can help people stay on an even keel and not have these negativity problems to begin with. It is meditation is awesome. You know, when I, I used to do what I started when I was about 15, it was on and off, on and off, you know, hit and miss. And now I've really been doing it steadily for, I would say, about seven years now. And just the difference, I remember when I started making it a daily practice, uh, just after the first two weeks, you know, I remember coming out of meditation, I would tell my wife, like, Man, I, I can't believe the the dramatic difference, you know, that, that I feel, you know, in, in every aspect of my being just after two weeks of sitting in meditation, sometimes for 10 minutes, sometimes for 20 minutes. But it, it really is uh, an awesome tool that, you know, kind of at a loss for words, the, 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 the peace that it brings, that that stillness you have in meditation seems to carry over into your everyday life. Uh, you know, some people take a little longer, some people it's shorter, but it's it's an awesome feeling. It, it really is. And the more people practice meditation, the easier it gets. And, you know, that's why I'm saying even a few minutes does the trick. Um, 10 to 15 minutes, um, people have the this false idea that to meditate, you know, you've got to sit in a lotus position and withdraw from the world and meditate for hours on end. And that is a spiritual path, but it doesn't necessarily need to be yours. You can get the same benefits from meditation in, in other ways. Uh, so both prayer and meditation are very important. And the higher we raise our vibration, again, I'd like to emphasize this, the less likely we are to have difficulties then. I mean, it's not going to magically make everything go away and life be rosy and perfect. I think it's the nature of life to learn by overcoming obstacles and 
you know, dealing with challenges. But uh, in terms of the negative forces out there, the dark entities, the toxic people, um, we're going to be more resilient and buffered against that kind of thing, less likely to encounter it in the first place. Uh, if, if our vibration is high enough, that this stuff can't even reach it. No, it's true, just like we were saying earlier about being in the presence of an angel, that it it seems to take away that, that fear and that dread, uh, you know, in certain situations. And uh, like you said, it's not a magic pill that makes everything go away, but uh, you are a lot more resilient. Things that you used to get nervous over or uh, thoughts that that would be fearful, uh, they don't affect you the way that they used to, and, and many times not at all, so... It definitely builds up the, uh, you know, the emotional and spiritual immunity, you know, where you're not, you're not so easily, uh, you know, kicked off your track in life. You know, it's it's like a daily vitamin. It is, and all all studies of meditation have pointed to that. There's uh, physical benefits. You know how the body is aided by it. Um, our emotions are smoothed out, um, our thoughts turn to a higher level, uh, we're less likely to engage in some of the lower emotions, and so many benefits that then start operating in the background all the time. So, you know, I've fertilized this field over and over again for years in my life uh, to the point where I feel it's operating all the time, whether or not I consciously think about it. And uh, even when I'm not consciously thinking of angels or, or uh, invoking their presence, um, the, this presence is around me because I have cultivated that energy uh, so much. And so, you know, let's not wait for a crisis. Many people wait for a crisis. Well, that's okay. We all get started some way. But... My advice is don't wait for a crisis to to cultivate this relationship and the many benefits of being in that field of energy. And, you know, you mentioned earlier on, Paul, about at holiday time, it's difficult for so many people. Uh, people feel alone. Um, they start thinking about things that haven't gone right in life. It's um, the holidays, I think, are more difficult than than they are happy for most of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons why I wrote Christmas Angels, True Stories of Hope and Healing is to portray stories like that, because I've got many examples of people who were facing um, lonely times, internal crises, problems, and they were able to make that connection with the, with the angelic realm and arrive at a better place, whether it was something miraculous or something that just enabled them to lift their spirits depended on the situation. And... Um, this book is, it's an ebook only, and it's available on Kindle. If you have Kindle Select, you can read it for free. Um, and, of course, this time of year, I, I have a lot of readers because people are thinking along these lines. But uh, they are inspiring stories that I think help other people also get through their holiday crises. They definitely are awesome stories, and they, they do inspire to you know, reach out and connect with the angels. Uh, I feel anybody that I've referred that book to, you know, uh, the holidays were, were quite different or, or at least somewhat different uh, after reading it. It took on a different, a different energy, uh, a different thought. And, you know, as we said, coming full circle, it, it is a time of year. I, th I think people need to connect, you know, with the angels, with the divine you know, it's becoming a society right now where, where people are more and more, you know, just uh, divided or by themselves or connecting with others through the, the iPhones and the computer screens. And, you know, people need companionship. People, people need hope. And I always say meditate, talk to the angels, you know, just if you don't know how to meditate, just close your eyes and focus on that presence around you. Where is it? Is it next to you, in front of you, hovering above you, uh, just feel where it is and ask questions. You know, what is your name? What do you want me to know right now? Let little things come to you, you know, and, and some people it may take a little time, but, but often 
those messages and answers come rather quickly. You know, trust what you get, and you're you're on your way to uh, making making a connection that's going to sustain you through those lonely times. You know, until society uh, figures itself out and isn't so uh, steeped in living life through the 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 lighted screen. That is an important point, especially about uh, how long does it take to get answers, you know, and then things might come quickly, they might not um, come immediately. And uh, I hear from people say, well, I've been meditating and praying, and I'm not getting anything. I'm not getting anything back. Well, they probably are. They just haven't realized it because of the subtle nature of it. Uh, and sometimes, especially if a person has not been in the habit of praying and meditating, it's like pouring uh, water down a dry riverbed. You, you've got to moisturize it for a while before things really start to flow. And so I tell people, well, just keep at it. Just keep at it and keep listening, and you're going to have a breakthrough. Uh, the breakthrough will happen. It, it is hard for people to uh, kind of get out of our own way sometimes, especially if we're conditioned, as we said earlier, this, you know, this is uh, fairy tales, it's it's childhood stuff, or I'm just making it up, who am I fooling? You know, it's it's hard to conquer those, those thoughts at first for some people, and, and they can definitely be, um, you know, barriers to getting those messages. I read a book years ago. I, I actually still have it on my shelf. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called Angel Speak. And I don't remember the author offhand, but basically the method, uh, method that they use is with your eyes open, get a pad and paper and just ask your angels a question and whatever comes to your mind, whatever it is, don't worry if you feel like you're making it up. Just write down on the piece of paper exactly what you hear and it really is a method that sometimes, uh, many times, right off the bat when people write something down, they'll go, wow, you know, I never thought of that. Where did that come from? You know, I, I feel like I wrote this, but yet I didn't write it because I, I didn't see this aspect to the problem or think about that answer to a problem. So asking and writing, I think, is... Uh, you know, it, it gives less time to sit there, you know, with your eyes closed going, ah, this isn't going to work. Who am I fooling? You know, you just ask and then you write, you know, there's, there's less time to get in your own way. So that, that might be a, a method that some people can use, uh, with more effectiveness, at least at first. Uh, yes, and uh, that, that's a form of automatic writing, and that is another good way to communicate. And um, by experimenting, people find out the ways that work the best for them. Some people use a pendulum, and they'll ask questions of the angel realm, and uh, the pendulum is a physical kind of movement that uh, helps organize an information and, and the receipt of information. Uh, that book, Angel Speak, by the way, that was written by Trudy and Barbara Griswold. Right, right. Um, Barbara's passed on now, uh, but um, it's an excellent book, and um, I can certainly recommend that. Um, the three books that I have out uh, that I recommend to people, I've, I've done a number of books on angels. Some of them have gone out of print. Uh, but Calling Upon Angels, How Angels Help Us in Daily Life, covers a lot of the territory that we've been talking about today, about um, how angels manifest and how we can recognize them and how we can connect to them. And if people want to learn more about the angelic realm, the Encyclopedia of Angels really covers the map. I've got history, religions, folklore, cases, uh, dramatic cases, uh, individual angels, uh, a lot of angel lore, and uh, people find that very illuminating as well because it answers a lot of questions they have about angels. And then um, my book, The Christmas Angels, True Stories of Hope and Healing. Yeah, and, and I would say to anybody uh, listening to the podcast, uh, not just because I have Rosemary on the phone, but because it's true, uh, if, you, if you want good books uh, concerning angels, angel contact, angel stories, uh, I would highly recommend her books over many of the other authors out there. When I had my experience and I started uh, researching as I got older to, to find answers, 
you know, there were some very popular authors and it was a lot of new age fluff. I was reading it and I was like, you know, I, it, I just didn't connect. There was something, I don't know if they were just kind of like going with whimsical thoughts that, that, you know, without really the research being done. Um, but Rosemary's books were definitely, when I read those, they were a lot of aha moments. It was solid information. And I just felt within myself, this, this is the real stuff. This isn't fluff. It isn't just trying to make a quick buck on the angel market. This is somebody that's been there, done that, and certainly knows what they're talking about. Well, my website is uh, visionaryliving.com if folks want to find out more about me and my work. And uh, I've got um, a list of my books. The best place to get them is Amazon. I don't sell them off my website. I travel too much to do the fulfillment. And I also want to mention, Paul, that I'm a publisher as well now and have been for some years. I publish books on the paranormal and metaphysical uh, fields. And the website for that is visionarylivingpublishing.com. And uh, those books of mine, uh, as well as other, other of my books, are um, up on that website, the covers and descriptions. Um, Visionary Living Publishing has a, a little over 30 books out now, um, some by me and some by other authors. And I'm, I'm growing at a rapid pace. That's awesome, and those links will be in the podcast description for, for anybody interested in getting Rosemary's books, or if you have uh, a manuscript you want to submit, it will all be uh, below in the description. You can contact her. And, Rosemary, this has been awesome. It's been a pleasure talking to you today, and uh, I hope one day we can do this again. I have other topics that would be uh, you're the person to answer the questions <laughs> you know, on these subjects. Well, I'd be delighted, Paul, and I certainly have enjoyed this conversation with you today. It's been very illuminating on the topic of angels, and I'm sure other people will um, enjoy it and benefit from it. I agree. So this is Paul James Caden and Rosemary Ellen Guiley from The Spirit Side bidding you peace, and I'll see you in the next podcast. <laughs>